Christina Lewinsky arrived at the Chhatrapati Shivaji International Airport after a long and very exhausting trip. Her trip brought her all the way from the United States of America to her motherland, India. Her flight took her through Heathrow and Doha International Airports. Her trip was for most part, spent in praying in silence or reading her Holy Bible. After her recent conversion from Islam to Christianity, Christina's tragic life had undergone drastic changes. She reveled in her new spirituality, finding fulfillment and joy whenever she prayed, read her Bible, or sang a hymn from those songs her lover used to sing to her while they were horseback riding or sitting by the lakeshore. Her new spiritual life seemed to connect her with her American lover in a tangible way. Michael Lewinsky continually appeared to her in dreams and sing to her. She could still hear his musical voice singing to her his favorite songs, Amazing Grace, Blessed Assurance, In Christ Alone, Lover of My Soul, etc. Whenever she read her Holy Bible, she heard his voice as if he is sitting by her side and reciting verses in her ears. Through her lover, many verses were implanted in her mind and grafted in her heart and she could recite them from memory. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, Matthew 5, 44. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, Romans 1, 16-17. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, Luke 6, 31, commonly known as the Golden Rule. Michael's continuous spiritual presence made her to conclude that although she could not have him physically as her husband, she was united to him spiritually. He remained perpetually her spiritual friend and guardian angel. In line with her spiritual changes, Christina's attitudes toward the world had changed too. She was no longer the timid girl she was prior to her conversion. She ceased fearing people around her, and this was punctuated by her decision to never again conceal her face behind a tyrannical and demeaning Islamic burqa, or veil. She neither flaunted her beauty nor hid it. She dressed normally and would initiate conversations with people that she had just met. She made friends easily. Of course, not all the people that she had met were keen to be friends. While at London in transit, she had chanced upon two Pakistani women who responded to her greeting and asked her about her name and country of origin. It is customary for Muslims who are traveling abroad in Western countries to try and find out if you are Muslim. This is not a casual question. If neither your name nor your clothes nor your eating and physical habits reveal your religious affiliation, they will ask you point blank if you are indeed Muslim. And woe unto you, if you happen to have a Muslim name but had converted to Christianity. My wife and I are one of the unlucky people who go by Muslim names but are Christians. We recently moved from a small city to a large one in North America. One of our new neighbors, Mr. Khan and Mrs. Khan from Pakistan, had hastily concluded from our names that we were Muslim. Mr. Khan and his son helped us unload the U-Haul truck and had carried our luggage and furniture into our new apartment. Meanwhile, Mrs. Khan cooked for us the most delicious Pakistani curry and naan we had ever tasted. Wasting no time, Mrs. Khan contacted her former employer and recommended my wife as an eminently suitable candidate for employment. My wife interviewed with the gentleman and was immediately offered a position. She happily accepted the offer and thanked the good neighbor, Mrs. Khan. I, on the other hand, felt less comfortable with the speed congeniality had mushroomed in our quick friendship and had an uneasy feeling that their generosity was based on a singular misunderstanding. I shared my worries with my wife, explaining that the Khans could have quite possibly been highly accommodating simply because they thought we were Muslims. Unfortunately, our lovely blossoming friendship did not last more than a few days. 
Mrs. Khan was shocked and became livid when she noticed our children coming back from their new school wearing uniforms bearing the name Sacred Heart School. She wasted no time confronting my wife and shouted in her face, How dare you send your children to a Christian school? My wife innocently replied, Because we are Christians. And that did it. To cut a long story short, my wife went to work the following day and was promptly told by her employer that Mrs. Khan had come to see him retracting his recommendation for her employment. As a result, Mrs. Ahmed had her name struck off the list of employees and another girl was appointed in her place. My poor wife was fired before she began working and didn't get any compensation at all. This might sound unbelievable and such things should not supposed to happen in the West, but sadly, religious prejudice knows no boundaries. After that, the Khans never even looked at us without undiluted displeasure or disgust. The two Pakistanis wanted to determine Christina's religious affiliation before engaging in friendly banter with her. When she related that she was born in an Indian Muslim family but had since embraced Christianity, they challenged her conversion and accused her of becoming an infidel, hypocrite, and apostate. A Muslim will never ever believe that another Muslim can convert to Christianity out of conviction. He will think that the reason behind the conversion is money, woman, or visa to a Western country. This inhibit belief comes as a result of the distorted and ugly picture which Islam depicted about Christianity. Christina left the international airport of Mumbai in a taxi and secured a hotel room in Bandra. She decided on Bandra because that was where she used to live when she was kidnapped and abused by an Indian Muslim man. She decided that she would stay in the hotel until she could find her biological mother. Christina knew that she was going to face a great deal of difficulty searching for her mother in a city as densely populated as Mumbai. It was like looking for a needle in a field of haystacks or searching for an ant in the Amazon. She did not know where to start and how to begin. She remembered that as a child she used to live with her poor family in a slum. She knew that if she went to the slums she would probably be raped and robbed by the Gondas, Indian gangsters and bandits. After much deliberation, Christina then decided to hire some locals to help her with her search. The crux to her search was her ability to find locals who were trustworthy. She had no intention of hiring help off the streets. After some thought, she figured that Christian Indians would be a good bet. When Sunday came along, Christina hailed a taxi and asked to be taken to the nearest Christian church. Being still a baby Christian, or a novice believer, Christina did not know there are Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, and many other denominational churches. The taxi driver took her to a church in Santa Cruz area where the local South Indian Christians met every Sunday. The church was simply called the First Church of India, owing to its claim that the Apostle Thomas, one of the Twelve Apostles of Christ, was its founder. Some of its older parishioners believed that their forefathers who founded the church were Christians even before the arrival of the Apostle Thomas in South India. Some of their staunch believers went further in their assertions and claimed that their ancestors were Christians even before Jesus Christ. The members of the First Church of India were so pure Christians, as they usually claim, that they would not allow room for a Christian girl from a Muslim background. They were like the Puritans, a people with covenant, who treated the Native Americans as the old Canaanites and they were the new Israelites and persecuted them. Likewise the South Indian Christians despised everyone who was not born a pure Christian. A Hindu or Muslim converted to Christianity might be considered as a pig or dog that came to worship among the sheep. In the same way, Christina was treated as a Gentile who dared to enter a holy sanctuary and defile it. When she felt that she was unwanted guest, she left the First Church of India and decided not to step foot there again. On the following Sunday, a cab driver took Christina to another Indian church in a place between Santa Cruz and Andhiri. At first, Christina thought that the cabbie misunderstood her request and brought her to a mosque. Nonetheless, the cabbie insisted that it was a Christian ecclesia and not a Muslim masjid. The congregation of that church was bound by strict rules and regulations, one of which was the posture of the faithful during service. 
There were no chairs or pews in the prayer hall, and the congregation was expected to be on bended knees during the entire service. Men and women sat separately, segregating even husbands from their wives, fathers from their daughters, and brothers from their sisters. No one was allowed to wear multicolored clothes and women were not to wear trousers and shirts, makeup, or gold. Television sets were prohibited among the faithful and it was roundly condemned as the devil's box. No one was permitted to watch movies or patronize film theaters. Otherworldly trapping like songs, music, dance were equally reviled. No believer was allowed to own a computer, laptop, iPad, iPhone, iPod, etc. Just like a 16th century's church, which considered every invention after the Industrial Revolution was banned and forbade its congregation to use it. That Indian church was referred to as the Faith Home and its congregation was divided into the Upper Home and the Lower Home. The Upper Home were the brothers and sisters who forsook home, family and school to devote their lives as full-time servants of the Lord and were considered a permanent fixture of the church. They were not allowed to marry or return to their homes, opting to live and die in the Faith Home. They were not permitted to seek the help of physicians in the event of ill health nor partake of any kind of medication. Naturally, the lower home were the believers who refused to make sacrifices to that extent. They were allowed to marry and be given in marriage. They were also allowed to work and go to schools. But, they were considered spiritually inferior to the members of the upper home. Any member of this lower group if he has been caught red-handed praying or laying hands on other member he would be sharply rebuked and warned and if he does it again he would be expelled and handed over to the devil to destroy his body. The pastor also was under perpetual celibacy vow. He was the main leader of the upper home and lower home. Besides him, there was a full-time mother who lorded over the sisters of both homes. At the close of the day's service, two female residents of the upper home approached Christina and told her that she should never ever again come to their holy faith home in immodest western clothes. That day, Christina happened to be wearing a t-shirt and jeans. During the three hours of service, she stayed on her knees, tortured by the unfamiliar posture. In addition to her unbearable pain and discomfort, the members of the church made it obvious that they disapproved of her mode of dress making her feel as if she was sitting naked in their midst. It didn't take Christina long to decide that she would never ever step foot there again. Her lesson learned, the following Sunday, Christina hailed a rickshaw driver and narrated her embarrassment at the hospitality of the two churches she visited and asked to be taken to a proper Indian church. The rickshaw driver claimed to have understood her problem and took her to a place where Gone Indians congregated in a nondescript church. Initially, Christina thought that the driver had not understood her request when the rickshaw came to a stop in front of a school. She saw no familiar signs of a church. The driver, insisted that it was a church and that he had on many occasions dropped of gone Christians at the very same place. Christina could not argue further with the driver when she heard hundreds of voices singing some popular Christian songs. She paid the fare and walked toward the familiar sounds. Entering the school hall, from the rear entrance, she felt as though she had barged into a wedding or disco hall. The sound of the heavy metallic instruments and the shouting of the people did not resemble in any way the Sunday service she was used to. She saw everybody dancing and shouting. Some of the people were playing tambourines while they were jumped and shouted to the music. At the stage she saw young men and women playing every kind of musical instrument she had seen and some she had not seen before. Every face she saw was happy and joyful. Even little children and old folks were standing on their feet and clapping their hands and singing. What surprised her more was that no one carried any hymn book, and everyone seemed to know the words by heart, shouting their praises at top of their voices. It was as if the whole congregation was in fact the church choir. When Christina realized that she was the only person who wasn't singing and dancing, she began to clap her hands and sway to the music. She stood on her feet for more than 40 minutes before finally the dancing and singing was over. 
she had never stood on her feet in church for such a long time and as the joyful praise and worship session was over, the leader of the huge congregation announced that everyone should shake hands with at least ten people around him before taking a seat. Christina was approached by many people who warmly shook hands with her. Once the service was over, five men and three women came to Christina and talked to her. All of them introduced themselves as the church pastors. Once again, she was shocked when she came to know that there were eight pastors in one single church. In the States, her church had one single pastor and a few elders. One of the female pastors told her that they were glad to have her in their midst. She then asked her to introduce herself and share the circumstances of her acceptance of Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Christina told her that she came recently from the United States of America and she was born and brought up in a Muslim family in Mumbai, but had since converted to Christianity. The female pastor asked her where she was lived and when did she convert. Christina briefly narrated her story and said at the present she was living in a hotel at Bandra. The pastors of the church were visibly excited to learn that Christina wasn't only a Muslim convert, but an NRI, non-resident Indian, who came all the way from the USA and was now putting up in a very expensive hotel. Christina then received and accepted an invitation to lunch at the senior pastor's house. She was inclined to decline but the pastor's wife was insistent. The pastor's wife was a pastor too. After she accepted the lunch invitation, fifteen young girls and twelve elderly women surrounded her. All of them greeted her and all of them praised her marvelous beauty. One girl told her, You look like a film star, another said to her, You look like the Queen of Bollywood, Aishwarya Rai, and yet a third girl likened her to the former Miss World, Priyanka Chopra. Oddly, none of them recognized her. At the senior pastor's house, Christina was peppered by a hundred and one question by the pastor's wife and some of her guests. Most of the questions were designed to pry into her background. Christina decided never to say anything about those evil men who abused her because she had forgiven them. Furthermore, she did not want anyone to know that she was rich woman and had millions of dollars. She did not tell them that she was a former Miss World and a one-time heroine in an Indian movie. She just told them that she was born and brought up as a Muslim girl in Mumbai and got adopted by a Hindu woman and had immigrated to America. Then, she said the reason of her visit to India was to find her biological Muslim mother. She informed them that her Muslim father died when she was a small girl. Christina once again explained that she had accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior and was baptized recently. The pastor and his wife promised to help her with her search. Christina then told them that she was willing to pay any of the church members who were willing to help her with her search, adding that she would cover all expenses. After the lunch, the senior pastor's wife invited Christina to stay in her house until she would find her mother. She admonished her against unnecessary expense of an expensive hotel and reminded her that it was the duty of the church to provide free accommodations to visiting Christian sisters like her. Christina told her that she did not want to be a burden to the church but both the pastors adamantly insisted she check out of the hotel that very day. Christina tried many excuses but to no avail. The pastor and his wife rejected them all and insisted on being hospitable. With no other polite option left, Christina gave in to their hospitality and resigned herself to the hope that it was for the best. Fellowship with the very Christians who proposed to help her find her mother required it.